This film is a project of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. Greenlee County, Arizona has a couple of towns. Duncan, population 812, is the most famous, if you can call it that. Just outside of town on the way to New Mexico used to be the Lazy Bee Ranch, once the family home of the first woman appointed Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. I came from Greenlee County, Arizona, which never had a population of over 10,000 people. But both Maricopa County, with its two million people, and Green Lake County had the same number of members of the House of Representatives in Arizona and the same number of senators. Huh? How can that be? Uh, let's do the math. In one county, 10,000 people had one representative, and in another, 2 million people also had only one representative? That's like giving everyone in Green Lake County 200 times as many votes as someone in Phoenix. Now, what kind of a makeup is that? What it meant was, that the little rural counties in Arizona had control of the legislature. And as it turns out, up until 1962, even though most Americans lived in cities or suburbs, rural counties dominated the legislatures across the entire nation. San Francisco was the birthplace of United States Supreme Court Associate Justice Stephen G. Breyer, who knew that the votes in his Northern California neighborhood had much more impact than the votes of his neighbors down South. And when I grew up in San Francisco, I knew perfectly well that the people in Northern California had probably more votes in the legislature than those in Southern California. And I would think that's great. Now, Justice O'Connor was probably more fair-minded. There's no question that today, the American people accept the concept, one person, one vote, but for half a century, our elected representatives did not. Legislators went unchecked, and the imbalance became more and more unfair. In the end, the Supreme Court, through a series of landmark decisions, made our voting districts essentially equal, establishing a principle of one person, one vote. It totally changed the makeup of the legislative branches of government in our country. But it almost didn't happen. Today, when you fly over America and see one big city after another, it's hard to imagine that only 100 years ago, most Americans lived on or near farms. The US was actually a relatively rural and agricultural society. In fact, election day is in November because the harvest was over by then. And travel from the countryside to a polling place was less likely to be disrupted by a winter storm. George Washington was a farmer before and after he was president. We were mostly an agrarian people right into the 20th century. And then we started to move. Populations were moving now pretty quickly away from farms and into cities. Well, that is the big story of the first half of the 20th century. America takes the count. It's 1920 and census time in the United States. Rich and poor, young and old, are just numbers to census takers. It's biggest counting job in history. By 1920, half of the population of the United States lived in cities or in urban counties, and um, that caused quite a controversy. This giant shift from the farms to industrial life in the cities and ultimately the suburbs had real implications for our government. Districts of both federal and state governments are apportioned by population. Apportionment is an abstract sounding word. It simply means the division of a political entity like a state uh, into districts. We don't have a pure democracy. We don't all go down to Congress ourselves and vote, but we elect representatives on our behalf to do that for us. A state has to be apportioned so that representatives can be allocated to each of those districts. Apportionment is supposed to be based on population. If an area has more people, it gets more districts and more representatives in its state legislature or Congress. The apportionment um, really allocates power. The people who have, in some sense, more votes than they deserve in the state legislature will get more political power in the state legislature. 
Each state has its own constitution, and those constitutions were all pretty much in place by the early 1900s, and most called for the legislatures to reapportion the districts as the population changed, so that representation from district to district would stay relatively balanced. But that didn't happen. So as time went on and Americans left the farm... It meant that the lines that had been in place, say, in 1901, were completely outdated. Migration brought people to the cities, but left their voting power behind. Even though the country was overwhelmingly urban or suburban by this time, the policy process in a lot of states was dominated by its very smallest places. And so as a result, you had some small rural towns that would have representation as large as some of the largest cities. They got away with it because uh, who could stop them? They were in charge. Those institutions were not going to reform themselves. And the courts did not step in to fix it. So the normal process of checks and balances wasn't working. So what do you do? OK, maybe the streets wouldn't have turned violent, but human history isn't full of examples of people in power giving it up peacefully. Our framers created a democracy with checks and balances so that no one could accumulate too much power. But by the mid-20th century, because of malapportionment, rural legislators had more than their fair share of it. And by 1946, the Supreme Court had an opportunity to correct all that. But one justice feared the solution would be worse than the problem. Felix Frankfurter was a giant of the court. He was born in Vienna and immigrated to the U.S. with his family when he was 12. He graduated at the top of his class at Harvard Law School, helped to found the American Civil Liberties Union, and in 1939, was appointed to the court by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Justice Frankfurter was a very intellectually gifted man. In 1946, Justice Frankfurter wrote the decision in a case called Colgrove versus Green. As far as he was concerned, Article I of the Constitution gave legislatures the power to set election rules. Apportionment was their problem to fix. He knew apportionment had gone haywire, but he believed that the court didn't have the authority to tell legislatures how to behave, and that if it tried, the court would get burned. The watchword was judicial restraint. And judicial restraint meant keep the judges out of it as much as possible, allow the legislatures to do what they want. The judicial restraint um, was essential for the preservation and the assertion of the court's authority and legitimacy. The court's power really comes from its ability to step in when and only when it needs to. And he worried that the courts would be trounced. They'd decide something and the decision would not be carried out the public would reject the decision, and that would be a grievous blow to the authority of the Supreme Court. In writing the Colgrove decision for the court, arguing that the court had no jurisdiction, Justice Frankfurter coined a famous phrase. Justice Frankfurter said in his opinion, courts must not get into this political thicket. Political. Political thicket. Political thicket. Political thicket became code that everyone understood to mean the court should stay out of politics that apportionment cases were non-justiciable. <laughs> Wait, non-justiciable? That's a word? If something's non-justiciable, that means it can't be justiced, which is to say that it can't be uh, decided by a court um, as a constitutional principle. The courts on non-justiciability really saw this idea of limiting their own power. In other words, what the courts had said was, we don't have the power to make the states change their political processes, that this is something that should happen from the people and not from us. The court said, no, we, we don't take these. That isn't anything we can do. There's no jurisdiction here. Justice Frankfurter's political thicket opinion became precedent. And for the next decade and a half, the courts refused to hear apportionment cases, leaving the legislators to fix the problem themselves. Well, this is a, the classic case of the fox guarding the hen house, right? That those who had the greatest to gain from malapportion were going to be the last uh, who wanted to change it. And the existing legislators, who were, of course, the product of the old system, they didn't want to vote themselves out of office, so they refused to change it. And for over a decade, the problem got worse, and it got worse all over. Democracy in America had been turned on its head 
we had become a nation of minority rule. In every state legislature, it only took about a third of the population to elect a majority of the seats. Something had to give. Charles Baker, the mayor of Millington, a Memphis suburb, sued Tennessee Secretary of State Joe Carr over malapportionment. Rural towns dominated cities like Nashville and Memphis, and twice in the mid-1950s, the state legislature voted against reapportionment, despite the fact that its own constitution required it. There was nowhere else to go but the courts to fix the problem. Given the court's recent history, Baker's lawyers knew they needed some help. John F. Kennedy had just become president. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Kennedy was a hero in World War II, had served as a congressman from Boston and then a senator from Massachusetts. As senator, he wrote an article for the New York Times called Shame of the States. The shame of the states for Jack Kennedy was malapportionment. It was the unequal representation of urban and rural interests and the domination of state legislatures by uh, rural counties that had very few people. And it was a shame that uh, we couldn't get out of the political thicket. And it was really a call to do so. The new president had a star solicitor general. It's his job to argue on behalf of the administration before the Supreme Court. Archibald Cox had served Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. He was a highly respected law professor at Harvard, where he had also been a student years before under Felix Frankfurter. Cox met with the Baker team and decided to argue the case himself before a very divided Supreme Court. The federal government's view in these matters is very, very important. When it comes into a case, the Supreme Court pays attention. So it mattered a lot what Archibald Cox, as Solicitor General, decided to do. I'm sure they did a wonderful job of convincing Archie that he should do what he already wanted to do, and that was to wade in to Baker versus Carr and clip the political thicket. On April 19, 1961, the young Kennedy administration argued Baker versus Carr before the Supreme Court. Baker versus Carr was one of the most grueling deliberations in the court's history. Oral arguments, typically an hour long, lasted two days. Everyone in the room knew what was at stake. Going into the oral arguments in April of, of 1961, all the judges are aware of how divisive a case this could be and how potentially transformative it would be. The public were pretty much unaware of this case that was moving through the Supreme Court and might force every legislature in the country to redistrict pretty powerful stuff. But the justices knew, and some of them were mortally afraid that if they issued such an order, if it came to that, the public would rebel, and uh, legislators, Congress would rebel, and they would be smacked in the face. Archibald Cox knew he had to be careful. If he asked the court to set a standard to determine exactly what shape or size a district should be, he'd lose the support of too many justices. So he decided to ask the court simply to agree that it could hear apportionment cases so that a standard could be set in the future. Cox's objective in this case was just to get the court to accept jurisdiction, go no farther. He felt that if they could get that far, that this would be the watershed case, that this would break everything open. Of course, even this step was too far for Justice Frankfurter, who feared for the legitimacy of the court more than ever. Justice Frankfurter at the Supreme Court conference, the secret conference at which they consider these matters, spoke for 90 minutes without a script. Now, usually you speak for one minute, or at the most, three minutes. He was a professor of law and uh, acted rather professorial, we're told, with his colleagues on the court. And I interrupt to say, as a former Please. professor, that that is an error. <laughs> the tension was too much. The justices could not come to a decision, so they put the case aside and scheduled a re-argument for that October. Even after the second argument in the fall, the decision was still in doubt. Chief Justice Earl Warren knew the court had to intervene, and he knew why. The great American ideal is that everyone shall be entitled to equal protection under the laws. The Warren Court is known for its expansive interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause. This is the clause in the 14th Amendment that says that no state shall deny anyone equal protection of the laws. 
The 14th Amendment was adopted after the Civil War to give former slaves equal rights, but it never mentions race. The Warren Court was about to take a huge step in enforcing the 14th Amendment by applying the concept of equal protection to the vote, everyone's vote. It was very rare that equal protection under the law was asserted as a general right as opposed to a right to protect a specific group. This is the critical case in which this becomes uh, asserted as something that's fundamental to all people. In March 1962, Chief Justice Warren's side carried the day in Baker and overturned Justice Frankfurter's political thicket opinion from 16 years before. The Baker decision was a 6-2 to two majority in favor of jurisdiction, but that doesn't begin to suggest the anguish behind the debate. Only eight justices participated because one justice, Charles Whitaker, had a nervous breakdown and resigned. Among the remaining eight, six wrote their own separate opinions. Justice Frankfurter, as expected, wrote a blistering dissent that the court was overstepping its bounds. He worried that legislatures across the country might ignore the court or even reject this ruling. This was right at the heart of what Felix Frankfurter believed, absolutely. And he viewed this uh, case as a fundamental break in the traditions of the court and a, and a fundamental doctrine of the court, which is a doctrine of judicial restraint. Justice William Brennan's majority decision was restrained and clear. Justice Brennan leaned heavily on the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, arguing that the case was not merely political, but a matter of protecting constitutional rights. He argued that the appellants claim that they are being denied equal protection is justiciable, and that the mere fact that the suit seeks protection of a political right does not mean it presents a political question. He ruled that the case was to go back to the lower courts, which had jurisdiction to work things out. Let the lower courts take the first crack at it, develop the facts, try to apply the principle in the case, and let it develop and unfold in a normal fashion. Sometimes we, we uh, will decide not more than we have to for the moment. Then let's see what happens now that the legislatures or the Congress knows uh, what the rules are. And maybe they'll take care of the problem. And it's much better if they do. Brennan turned Colgrove on its head. Colgrove kept politics from solving the problem because it allowed legislatures to do nothing. There was nothing forcing the politicians to act. So the normal process of checks and balances wasn't working. And so Brennan, in his opinion, in a subtle way, had allowed politics to happen without dragging the court into the political thicket. In a concurring opinion, Justice Clark called Tennessee a crazy quilt of districts with no rational basis. He pointed out that the legislators had passed up opportunities to fix the problem and that the only way the problem was going to be fixed was if the courts forced them to do so. Mr. President, would you comment on the Supreme Court reapportionment decision and say whether there's anything the federal government could do to support it? Quite obviously, uh, the right to fair representation, to have each vote count equally, is, it seems to me, basic to the successful operation of a democracy. Archibald Cox had carried the day for the president, but he knew that this meant that the hard work had just begun. The court had opened the floodgates, and the political foundation for the entire nation had been thrown into question. Within hours after the announcement of the Baker decision, a redistricting lawsuit was filed against the state of Georgia. By the end of the year, redistricting lawsuits had been filed against 34 states. So all of these cases are coming down the pike fairly quickly, and there is going to have to be this reckoning, this moment in which a standard is set. The Baker case had become the first of a series of cases to reach the Supreme Court known now as the apportionment cases. And there were two more that, along with Baker, had the greatest impact. The next year, 1963, the court decided in favor of reapportioning districts in Georgia's congressional primaries. Out of that case, Gray versus Sanders, came the defining phrase for all of the cases, one person, one vote. Sometimes expressions um, strike a chord with people and become part of the fabric. The idea it has tremendous resonance, and legislatures mm -hmm. and the public in general has gone along with that, accepting it as fair. Many people thought that if one person, one vote wasn't already in the Constitution, it should be. And a year after that, in 1964, the court made it official with Reynolds v. Sims. <laughs> 
faced with so many similar suits, it announced six apportionment decisions on the same day, with Reynolds setting the standard. In Reynolds, the state of Alabama was being sued because, like most states, it had two chambers in its legislature, a House and a Senate. The House was based on population, while the Senate was based on acreage or size. Alabama argued that it was the state's prerogative to determine the makeup of its own legislature, and that this was like the U.S. Senate. The court said, no, the U.S. Senate is unique. For one thing, it's in the Constitution. For another thing, the United States is a federation. The states came together in the first place and made that compromise and wrote it into the Constitution. In order to get them to join together, we had to say, OK, if you join, you each get two senators. Uh, that wasn't true of the states. The states didn't promise their people or their legislators that they would have such a system, and the court rejected it. Chief Justice Warren wrote this opinion for the eight-to-one majority himself. Legislators, he wrote, represent people, not trees or acres. He wrote that both houses of a state legislature had to be apportioned on a population basis, and that districts had to be substantially equal in size. And in Reynolds, Justice Warren issues the decision, and we finally now have the court being willing to set the standard. The Chief Justice went back to the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and said that it requires substantially equal legislative representation for all citizens in a state, regardless of where they reside. That weighting votes differently according to where citizens reside is discriminatory. The court ruled that legislatures had to reapportion and had to do it by the 1966 election. Baker didn't deal with an actual application of the principle, but Reynolds versus Sims did. And it articulated the notion that each vote should have approximately equal weight. It said so expressly. And what I think Earl Warren thought was that that's the basic principle of democracy embedded in this Constitution, and it is the safest, most secure, and fairest way to have a government of laws in the United States. And he was right. Reaction was loud and furious, but not too effective. Senator Everett Dirksen introduced a constitutional amendment that would have kept the courts out of the apportionment business, and over 30 states passed a call of some sort for a constitutional convention. The resolution is adopted. There was a movement at the time to amend the Constitution, to overturn the case, and to permit this. But it, the yes, amendment it didn't pass. Because people understood, look, if we want to be heard in our legislature and in our Congress, we've got to support this concept. It makes sense. Americans overwhelmingly believed that one person, one vote was vital to making democracy work. Legislatures all over the country got the message. They complied with the court's ruling, and fast. By 1967, just five years after Baker, almost every state has maps that have equal population districts. It was one of the great surprises in history. All the warnings that Felix Frankfurter had given, the country will hit back at you, the court will fall, it will be the end of the Supreme Court. None of it happened. This was welcomed by the majority of the people who didn't want to have their legislatures controlled by some handful of rural state senators and representatives. And lo and behold, equal votes meant equal representation and power, equal money. And what we saw was a great equalization of the distribution of state resources for education, for roads, for hospitals, for public improvements of all sorts. In the end, what happened wasn't a revolt or a revolution, but an orderly process. Legislators redistributed power and wrote themselves out of jobs by drawing up new districts to comply with the court's ruling and the Constitution. The fact that states were able to comply with Reynolds within a few years tells us a few things. It tells us something about the Supreme Court and the power and authority of the Supreme Court, what it means to live in um, a nation of laws where even if you would disagree with the law, you're compelled to follow the law. We'll leave the last word to Chief Justice Earl Warren. His court changed the very notion of freedom and equality in American life, but of all the landmark decisions it handed down, he said this about the first apportionment case, Baker v. Carr, and its profound impact. That case, from which all the other reapportionment cases followed, 
is perhaps the most important case that we've had since I've been on the court.